Dateline, Desert News, October 10th, 1864, quote, The attention of our readers is called to the list of places in the several wards where this city subscribers can receive their news each Wednesday morning. We are confident that this arrangement will prove very acceptable to the public, but in order to put it in successful operation, it will be necessary for each subscriber to call at or send to the office for this number and report whether he prefers receiving his paper at the office or at the places designated in his ward. With a little promptness upon this point on the part of our subscribers, we hope to soon have this new arrangement correctly at work for the benefit of all concerned. Places where subscribers can receive the Deseret News each Wednesday morning include 7th Ward, John B. Kelly, Bookbinder. I'm Wendy, this is Demolish Salt Lake, and the story of the John B. Kelly House. At 422 South, 200 West, between a state liquor store and a McDonald's, sits a fire-damaged, boarded-up white house behind an overgrown yard. Some will consider this house an eyesore, just another abandoned old building left to rot away in need of being torn down. A demolition permit is pending on this building, and it will be torn down and replaced with a multiple-story apartment building. When this happens, we will lose a house that is very important to our collective community history and our historic built environment. So let's talk about the John B. Kelly House. I want to start off with some background on how Salt Lake was laid out back in 1847. After arriving in the valley, Brigham Young stated that no man should have to buy land, but should have land measured off for him for city and farming purposes. So the city was divided into 114 10 acre blocks. Each of these blocks were divided into eight lots of one and a quarter acre, large enough to build a house, a garden, an orchard, and hold farm animals. The uniform grid pattern was used so every man had equal resources. A great idea in theory, but didn't actually pan out that way. Those in positions of power chose their lots first. And since some of them had more than one wife, they also got to choose multiple lots in the choice areas of town. And if you wanted land, you had to be married. Sorry, single men, you didn't get any land. In 1849, the city was divided into 19 LDS church wards of nine blocks each. Each ward had a meeting house and a bishop assigned by church authorities. Wards served as a way to help the community. Better off individuals help those less fortunate. Wards met as a community for church and entertainment. They also reflected one's social and economic standing. Those who lived in wards that encompassed South Temple or the avenues had greater social status than, say, those that lived on the outskirts of town. The seventh ward was a sought after location because the ground was level and it was close to the center of town. This is where John B. Kelly built his home after arriving in Salt Lake City. John was born on the Isle of Man in 1824. He converted to the LDS faith in 1841 and married Helena Quick in 1844. They had three children who all passed away before the family left the Isle of Man. That happened in 1853 when John, Helena, and their sons, George and Albert, sailed to the States and arrived in Utah later that year. His modest adobe house was built sometime around 1860. He and Helena would go on to have six more children by 1868. John was a bookbinder by trade and brought a bookbinding machine with him from England. He started a bookbinding company, which could very well have been the first of its kind in Utah. He ran this bookbinding and printing company for a few years. This is probably where he adopted the middle name of Bookbinder. Unfortunately, John didn't do so well in running his own business, and he sold it to the Deseret News, but continued to operate it as an employee of the newspaper. He trained his sons, George and Albert, in the trade, and they established Kelly Brothers, later renamed Kelly Company, in 1896. 
In fact, a three-story brick warehouse on West Temple was most likely built for Kelly Company in 1891. This building is part of the larger Arrow Press Square complex and is the last one still standing. The company ran into financial trouble and lost the building in the late 1890s. It was then purchased by Utah Lithography Company, of which George Kelly was a stockholder. If you have ever been to Benihana or the Blue Iguana in downtown Salt Lake at 165 Southwest Temple, you have been to this building, which is also an awesome example of adaptive reuse. In 1866, John married a second wife, Emma Sims. She was also an immigrant from England, trained as a bookbinder, and worked at the Deseret News, which sounds like a perfect match. They had two children, a girl and a boy. Sadly, their son lived only for one year. She and her children lived in a house nearby. When Helena died of dropsy, which we refer to today as edema, in April 1877, Emma and her daughter moved in with John and his children. John passed away in July of 1883 at the age of 59. He is buried in the Salt Lake Cemetery next to Helena. Emma lived in the house until her death in 1899. She is also buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. Her daughter, Lily, took ownership of the house and her descendants owned it for a very long time. Currently, it is owned by an LLC. Now let's turn our attention to the house itself because the house is really at the heart of our story. Let's talk about the use of adobe in early Salt Lake buildings. Logs and lumber wasn't easy to come by because the valley didn't have many trees and the lumber available was needed for other things like cooking and heating, furniture, roofs, water mills, and tools. So adobe it was. Early bricks were made of mud and straw pressed into molds with hands and feet. Sure, there was a learning curve, like when Hiram Clausen's house collapsed on itself in 1852 because he used various sizes of bricks in the construction and running water in the cellar ruined the foundation. But they figured it out and soon adobe production became a much needed industry and a part of the church public works department. Adobe buildings stayed pretty cool in the summer because of their pale color that reflected the sun. It was a different story in the winter, though. These houses were drafty and not well insulated, necessitating the use of a fireplace or stove for warmth. They were also fireproof, which comes in handy when the local fire department has to harness up horses before they can get out to a fire. In the 1860s, when John Kelly was looking to build his house, he chose adobe for the building material. He also chose a temple form design that came out of the Greek revival period of American architecture and was pretty popular in New England at the time. What's cool about seeing temple form houses here in Utah is it documents the New England heritage of the early pioneers. It's also one of seven basic house styles built in the early years of settlement and one of the rarest found in the state. The Kelly House is one of a very few temple form houses still standing. Another great example is the Alma Staker House in Mount Pleasant. Luckily, that house was saved from being raised for a parking lot, and you can still go see it today. So what makes a temple form house a temple form house? Well, there is a central unit, one room wide and two rooms deep, with smaller wings on one or both sides. The wings are usually identical in size and are always lower in height than the central unit. The Kelly House follows this design with a dominant one and a half story central unit with identical single story wings on both sides. The front door is centered between two windows on the first floor. There is another single door on the second story centered just above the front door. We'll get to that door in a minute. Each side wing has a door and a window. The proportions of the house and identical wings makes the front of the house symmetrical. And I don't know about you, but I find something very pleasing about a symmetrical house. Okay, now back to that single second story door. Have you ever heard of an angel door? Me either, not until this week. 
So this is a door much like the one on the Kelly house. That leads to nothing and would make for a pretty nasty fall if you stepped out of one. You've probably seen this on other historic houses. The folklore is that this is a doorway to a portal where heavenly spirits can enter a house to visit the occupants. I mean, if you're into making a way for spirits to visit your house, then this makes perfect sense. In reality, there's a much more earthly explanation. At one point in time, this door opened up to a porch roof terrace that was removed or, for whatever reason, was never built in the first place. I still like the folklore explanation better. Determined to find out about this mysterious door on the Kelly House, I dug through the National Register of Historic Places nomination form, and I found a picture of the house I think was taken around the 1890s with the original front porch roof terrace. Mystery solved. This picture also shows that the terrace was held up by Tuscan columns, and there was a beautiful decorative molding along the roof of the porch and the gable of the house, which is very reflective of the Greek Revival period. Over the years, changes were made to the house. A brick addition was added in the early 1930s. A small stucco structure was added to the top of that in the late 50s. The house was divided into three apartments in the 30s, and the indoor staircase was taken out and replaced with an exterior one on the back of the house. Despite being divided into apartments, the interior has held much of its original integrity. The house was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in July of 1983. I also want to take just a minute and talk about the Albert H. Kelly House. In 1884, Albert built a two-story, Italianate-style house on the lot right next door to his dad's house. Albert and his wife, Josephine, had seven children and lived at the house until their deaths in 1924 and 1940, respectively. The house was divided into two apartments soon after Albert's death. The Kellys sold the house in 1942, and today it houses David Erickson Fine Art. It was also placed on the National Register in July of 1983. As of yet, there is no demolition permit application for this house. This is not the first time the Kelly house has been faced with demolition. Back in 1993, when Elizabeth Bowden, John Kelly's great-great-granddaughter, owned the house, the city was looking for a new site to build a stadium for the Salt Lake Trappers baseball team because parts of the current stadium, Dirks Field, was condemned, and they set their sights on the block where the Kelly house stood. The public seemed to favor replacing Dirks Field with the new stadium, as city officials saw a chance to move a moneymaker from a residential area to an economically troubled area. However, Mrs. Bowden stuck to her guns and threatened to keep the plan tied up in litigation. Apparently, this turned into quite the heated debate. But eventually, the whole plan was scrapped. The Kelly House was safe for the time being, and Dirks Field was torn down and replaced by what we now know as Smith's Ballpark. In recent years, Preservation Utah, a local nonprofit that works with government officials in the community to save our historic buildings, put forth their best effort to save the Kelly House. But it was an uphill battle with a difficult property owner that ultimately they did not win. And remember how I said the house is on the National Register of Historic Places? Are you wondering how a house on the register can be demolished? Well, let me explain that to you. While a register listing does give tax credits for preservation, it does not restrict a private property owner from doing whatever they want with the building, and there is no requirement for federal permission to demolish it. All it takes is applying for a demo permit from the city and gaining approval. So once again, the Kelly House is faced with demolition, but this time it's a done deal. I suggest taking a visit to the Kelly House while it's still standing. 
It may look pretty rough, but this is one of the few buildings I'll talk about on this podcast that you can still go see and experience. Because once the house is gone and a new building is in its place, the Kelly House will only be a memory to those who once loved it. I want to give a shout out to my friends at Preservation Utah for bringing my attention to the Kelly House. There are people and organizations out there like Preservation Utah that work hard every day to preserve our historic built environment. If you want to learn how you can get involved, reach out to your local historic society or preservation nonprofit. And if you're here in Utah, follow Preservation Utah on Facebook and Instagram. Community involvement is key to making sure that our historic buildings are around for our future generations. As always, I've posted pictures of the house on my Instagram and Facebook pages at Demolish Salt Lake Podcast. You can also follow me on Twitter at Demolished SL Pod. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. I'm going to let you all decide the subject of episode five. So look for a poll on my social media accounts in the next day or two to vote for one of two long-lost historic buildings. I love them both, so I can't decide. Then I'll be back in two weeks with your choice. We'll see you then.